Okay, here we are for another session. And uh, at the end of our last session, we had been talking a little bit about the romance as a form, as a literary genre or literary form. So since we've had a, uh, a break since the last session, let me just go back and pick up a couple of points that we were making at the end of our last class by way of review, and then we'll move on. So the romance as a literary form typically is a narrative, long or short, more often long than short, by the way, focusing mainly on the courtly class, that is to say, kings, queens, dukes, duchesses, you know, the knights and ladies and so forth, uh, such as in the Arthurian romances of the knights and ladies of the round table. Though there may be some figures from the lower classes in the romances, but they are typically not major figures, unless there's some sort of irony in which uh, there's someone who is thought to be of the lower class who actually turns out to be a long lost son of somebody from the aristocracy. I mean, you can have that kind of thing. So, or you can have a satirical romance. There's a Scottish example of one where somebody who is from the lower classes eventually rises and becomes one of the great knightly heroes of his time. Plots are generally centered on tests or quests. Tests or quests. And these can either involve heroic tests or quests in which the, the knights or other warriors will have to perform heroic deeds. Or the tests or quests may involve love, typically a lady love. Though this is going to be shifted around in Sir Gawain and the Green Knight in an interesting way. Or it could be both. You could have a romance in which you have lots of heroic deeds taking place and the quest for the lady love. There will naturally enough be a good deal of attention paid to the codes of chivalry and of courtliness. Of chivalry and courtliness. And as we shall see, the Christian code as well in something like Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, but also in Chrétien's Percival. Sometimes there may be shifts in male female identities, and we will see that in Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, where the, uh, the man and woman will change conventional roles or conventional places in the development of the plot. But more about that when we get into Sir Gawain. And there will typically be elements of the magical or supernatural in romances. So that, looking ahead to Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, clearly uh, the Green Knight is some kind of a supernatural or at least magical being. The, uh, the same kind of thing could be said of the early stories of Arthur that I was talking about in our last class, where Arthur, uh, out of a seemingly very unpromising youth, comes upon this sword in the stone that others have tried to draw before him and have been unable to do so. And there's a legend that whoever can draw the sword from the stone will be the king of England. And Arthur at one point jumps up on the rock and draws the sword from the stone. Nobody can believe it, but nevertheless, some followers rally round him and eventually he wins his kingdom as king of England. Uh, wielding his sword Excalibur. And clearly there's something magical about that. When Lancelot, at the time of the death of Arthur, throws the sword Excalibur into a lake, the arm of the Lady of the Lake comes up 
and catches the sword and takes it into the depths of the water. So again and again, we have magical elements or elements of some kind of supernatural figures or agents. So how does all of this apply to Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, one of the great medieval romances, and certainly one of the great medieval romances in English? This was also composed in the 14th century, more or less contemporaneously with Chaucer. One student asked me during the break, why don't we read this in the original Middle English as we did Chaucer? Well, the reason for that is that it's in a northern, more particularly a northwestern English dialect, which is much farther from modern English than Chaucer's dialect is. And so it's much more difficult for us to read. Now, graduate students or scholars who specialize in this area would obviously have to learn it, to read it in the original. But for a class such as ours, we are uh, given the allowance of reading this in translation. So let's talk about the work itself. It has a four-part plot construction into what are called the fits. Here in our translation, they're simply called parts, part one, part two, part three, and part four. But in the Middle English, these parts were referred to as fits. Fits or parts one and four treat the quest of Gowan as a knight and as representative of Arthur's round table. Now, what is this test? As we're going to see in the very beginning of the work, it is the whole test of the beheading game, wherein, once again, Arthur is waiting for some marvel to occur during the holiday season between Christmas and Easter tide, or excuse me, uh, uh, the New Year time, and. Uh, of course, the marvel occurs. In this case, the Green Knight comes in, as we shall see in a moment, and uh, challenges the court so that anybody in the court who wishes to or who dares to can come forward and cut off his head. Well, he cuts, you know, Gowan gets up, he cuts off the head of the Green Knight, and then, of course, he is going to have to meet the Green Knight a year hence in what is going to become part four of the romance in which he's going to have to bow down before the ax himself. Well, parts two and three in the middle of the work feature the tests in and around the castle. This is the game within the game. The game within the game. What the host of the castle that Gowan comes to in the middle of the romance designates as the exchange of winnings. We're going to talk about this in more detail when we get into the work itself. That the host and his men are going to go off in the woods and hunt each of three days and whatever they win in the hunt they will share with Gowan, who's going to stay back in the castle. And so we have the three hunts for the deer on the first day, the boar on the second day, and the fox on the third day, which parallel the three hunts, and notice I put quotes around that, in the bedroom back in the castle where the lady of the house attempts to seduce Sir Gowan. So she is the hunter, and he the hunted. And in each case, the hunt of the lady for Gowan as her, her prey parallels the hunt outside 
of each one of these animals. So that in the first animal, excuse me, in the first of these uh, tests, Gowan is likened to the deer. In the second, Gowan is likened to the boar. And in the third, he is likened to the fox. So we've got an elaborate kind of parallelism going on in the work. And Gowan's behavior in parts two and three, in other words, in the bedroom scenes in which he is the object of the hunts, Gowan's behavior there determines the outcome of the beheading game which was begun in the first part and concludes in the fourth part. Okay, now I'm just talking about this in a general way, just so you can get an idea of the symmetry of the plotting. This plot is very, very, very intricately designed. And then in the aftermath, Gowan returns to Arthur's court, and there he makes his confession. He's embarrassed by his behavior. And so he confesses his embarrassment to the entire court at the end. OK? Everybody got that? All right. OK, so let's take a look at the text itself. This is in a translation by Marie Boroff, and she has done a marvelous, marvelous job of retaining much of the poetic quality of the original. And that's extremely difficult to do in a translation of poetry, and also remain faithful to the sense of the original. So let's look at as much as we have time for in this period, and then we'll be carrying the discussion on into another period as well. Since the siege and the assault was ceased at Troy, 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 aha, the great Homeric epic, the great story of ancient Troy, where Troy was placed under siege by the Greeks for some nine years. And then eventually it fell. Without going into the story of the fall of Troy, uh, let me simply say that this became one of the most important and indeed paradigmatic narratives in Western civilization from ancient times through the Middle Ages and well beyond. So that while people didn't have Homer in the Middle Ages directly, remember they had lost most of Greek literature, Greek science, Greek mathematics, Greek philosophy, and so forth, uh, at the end of the ancient period, at least in the West, these things had been lost. And only gradually were they becoming recovered. And we've already talked about the recovery of Aristotle through the Arabic scholars in North Africa in the Middle Ages, in the 12th and 13th centuries. But uh, the literature had not yet really been recovered. It was only going to be recovered in the 15th and 16th and 17th centuries. The, the, liter the great literary works of ancient Greece and to a certain extent Rome. But people knew about it. They knew the basic outlines of the story from summaries of the story. Since the siege and the assault was ceased at Troy, the walls breached and burnt down to brands and ashes. The knight that had knotted the nets of deceit was impeached for his perfidy and proven most true. It was highborn Aeneas. Aeneas? Where do we know Aeneas from? Where do we know it? Yeah, go ahead. Virgil's Aeneid. 
Virgil's Aeneid. Okay, what does what does Virgil's Aeneid tell the story of? Do you remember? Uh, the founding of Rome. Okay, the, but but who is Aeneas? Do you remember? One of the Trojans who escaped. Yes, one of the Trojans who escaped. And, and Virgil's Aeneid is all about what happens to Aeneas and the other survivors of Troy as they work their way across the Mediterranean and eventually get up into Italy. And Aeneas marries there a Latin princess. And so he is going to, uh, through his, his grandchildren and great-grandchildren and whatnot, he is ultimately going to be the founder of Rome. OK, so during the Middle Ages, again, bits and pieces of Virgil had survived. And people knew that general story. And Virgil's story, of course, builds on Homer's versions of what happened at Troy and the aftermath. <clears throat> it was highborn Aeneas and his haughty race that since prevailed over provinces and proudly reigned over well nigh all the wealth of the West Isles. The West Isles? Hard to tell. What are the West Isles? The British Isles? Maybe. Great Romulus in Rome repairs in haste with boast and with bravery builds he that city and names it with his own name that it now bears Tisius to Tuscany and towers raises Langobard in Lombardy lays out homes and far over the French sea Felix Brutus on many broad hills and high Britain he sets. Now, she's done a good job up to this point. I'm talking about the translator, Marie Borov. He's done a very good job up to this point of giving us a sense of the alliterative pattern of the poetry. Where have we seen alliterative poetry before? Anybody remember? Where have we seen alliterative poetry before? Beowulf and Old English poetry, right? But not in Chaucer. Chaucer is using iambic pentameter lines in couplets in the uh, general prologue to the Canterbury Tales, isn't he? Rhyming couplets. That's a form that came in through French, ultimately from Latin, but, but through French poetry into English poetry, another one of the influences of French. But here, notice, what the Gowan poet is doing is reverting to a pattern in what came in the 14th century to be known as the alliterative revival, the revival of alliterative verse from Old English times, except then look at the tail end of that stanza. You have a very short line, most fair, and then notice the rhyming, where war and rack and wonder by shifts have sojourned there, and bliss by turned with blunder in that land's lot had share. OK, see the alliteration? Where, war, rack, wonder, the alliterating Ws. But also, notice the rhymes. Wonder, there, blunder, share, the end rhymes. So that this is a unique experiment in English literature, a, a truly unique adventure, as it were, in poetic creation. Now, I'm using the word unique in its true sense, by the way. Sometimes we hear people talk about something being unique as if it's you know, interesting or unusual. The term unique means one of a kind, one and only one of that kind. That's what unique really means. 
So to say something is very unique makes no sense at all, really. Well, uh, then we go on. And since this Britain was built by this Baron Great, hear the alliterating bees again? Bold boys bred there in broils delighting until we get down to line 26 among the British kings. King Arthur was counted most courteous of all. Notice courtesy. We we're talking about that in connection with not only courtly love, but also in connection with King Arthur, right? Uh, not King Arthur, the, uh, the knight in the general prologue, uh, who was noted for his courtesia. Okay. Wherefore an adventure I aim to unfold, that a marvel of might some men think it, and one unmatched among Arthur's wonders, if you will listen to my lay but a little while, as I heard it in hall, I shall hasten to tell anew. Notice once again, I've heard this. The whole conception of oral tradition, something which is sung in the hall and then passed on and then passed on and then passed on in an essentially oral fashion, in an oral tradition. This king in the next stanza lay at Camelot at Christmas tide, at Christmas time. And here we're talking not simply about Christmas, Christmas Day, but we're talking about the whole period of Christmas tide. You know the song? What is, what is the song about the days of Christmas? How many are there? The 12 days of Christmas, right? The 12 days of Christmas. It lasts through January 6th, which in the church was Epiphany. Uh, and also, this uh, was known for a very, very, very long time as Little Christmas. And it used to be that you would keep your Christmas tree up until January 6th. Some people still do. The king lay at Camelot at Christmas tide. Many good knights and gay his guests were there, arrayed at the round table, rightful brothers. And the feasting and fellowship and carefree mirth is going on. And everyone is very happy. And the new year is new. And then we see in line 74 and following, Guinevere, the goodly queen, gay in the midst, on a dais well decked and duly arrayed, with costly silk curtains, a canopy over, and so on and so on and so on. Well, then we find out about Arthur's common practice of not feasting until a marvel occurs, something that I was talking about in our last session. But Arthur, in the next stanza, the one that begins at line 85, would not eat till all were served, so light was his lordly heart and a little boyish. His life he liked lively, the less he cared to be lying for long or long to sit, so busy his young blood, his brain so wild. We're talking about a young King Arthur here, not the old King Arthur. And also a point of pride pricked him in heart, for he nobly had willed he would never eat on so high a holiday till he had first heard of some fair feat or fray, some far-born tale of some marvel of might that he might trust by champions of chivalry achieved in arms, or some suppliant came seeking some single knight to join with him in justing in jeopardy each to lay life for life and leave it to fortune to afford him on field, fair, hap, or other. In other words, this is what Arthur is waiting for. And so we have the good Gowan, who is sitting next to Guinevere in line uh, 109. And uh, Gowan is going to be presented as 
the perfect young knight, but an untested, at yet, as yet untested young knight. And then in line 136, in through the doorway hurdles an unknown rider. One of the greatest on ground in growth of his frame from broad neck to buttocks so bulky and thick. And his loins and his legs so long and so great, half a giant on earth I hold him to be. But believe him no less than the largest of men and that the seemliest in his stature to see as he rides. For in back and in breast, though his body was grim, his waist in its width was worthily small, and formed with every feature in fair accord was he. Great wonder grew in the hall at his hue most strange to see, for man and gear and all were green as green could be. So this is the green knight. He's not only dressed in green, but his skin is green, his horse is green, his apparel on himself and on his horse is all green, and of course his weapon, his axe, is green as well. And so we have a description of him which goes on to the point where in 175 and following, a green horse, great and thick, a headstrong steed of might, embroidered bridle quick, mount matched man aright. And gay was this goodly man in guise all of green, and the hair of his head to his horse suited. Fair flowing tresses enfold his shoulders, a beard big as a bush on his breast hangs, that with his heavy hair that from his head falls was evened all about above both his elbows, and so on. Notice in line 206, he's holding a piece of holly, a piece of holly. Now what is holly associated with? Holly is associated with Christmas also, isn't it? Why do you suppose holly would be associated with Christmas? Does anybody know? Why do you have Christmas trees? Why do you have wreaths of holly at Christmas time? Yeah, did you have a, go ahead. Does it have to do with the seasons of the coming of spring? Yes, it does have to do with the seasons. And what is distinctive about holly, about the evergreen tree, which is used for the Christmas tree, the holly wreath? Yes. It stays green. It doesn't die in the winter. Yes, 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 yes. And this is extremely important because when does Christmas occur? It occurs not only in the center of winter, but it occurs at a time that originally was set at the equinox, right? The, the winter uh, uh, solstice, excuse me, the winter solstice, which is the point at which you have, it's right dead in the center of winter, it's the point at which you have the longest night and the shortest day, okay? And that became assimilated from ancient pagan rituals and myths to the Christ child who comes at the point of the birth of the new year. Just as from a Christian point of view, Christ's birth is supposed to be issuing in a whole new era of human history, so also does that come symbolically at the time of the birth of the new year. Because the new year doesn't really begin on January 1st. I mean, the only reason for putting it on January 1st is to make the arithmetic work out right. 
But as people around the world have always known, it's the solstice that really is the, the end of the old year and the beginning of the new year. Uh, from, at least from an astronomical point of view. Now, in terms of springtime rituals, the beginning of the year could be located in springtime. So, and many cultures have indeed uh, located the beginning of the year in springtime for that reason. So, we don't know exactly when, uh, when Jesus was born. I mean, there's no particular reason uh, for us to assume on historical grounds anyway that he was born on the date when his birth is celebrated, nor do we know the year in which he was born. So it was only according to tradition that these dates ultimately came to be fixed. And largely they fulfilled certain symbolic functions that were symbolically important to the people. Okay? Uh, in ancient Rome, this was the time of the celebration of the return or the beginning of the return of the sun. And of course, at least in English, the word sun and the word sun as in S-O-N, son of God, came to be equated one with another. Uh, obviously, that doesn't work in every language. But in any event, uh, that's the kind of symbolic appropriateness that seemed so natural that it just had to be right. So, the holly. Things green in the middle of winter when everything else has been devastated. This is the promise of the return of the greenery of spring and summer. Okay, even in the dead of winter, we still have something which survives and promises the return of life. So, yeah, question? Um, well, holly is also associated with kissing. Is that just a coincidence or is that something that... Mistletoe. Oh, isn't that the same thing? No, 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 no. Holly, holly's not the same. But the, it's a good question, though, because uh, the mistletoe, which is, which is hung up, that goes back, apparently, to ancient Celtic rituals in which uh, people, not only uh, among the Germanic peoples, would, would have the evergreen trees and whatnot, but uh, in the Celtic lands, they apparently uh, had holly and mistletoe. And the mistletoe was apparently cut down from the trees. It's a parasite was cut down from the trees at this time of the year. And at some point along the way, it became associated with love and lovers. And so if you hang up mistletoe, uh, say, over a doorway, uh, you know, then you presumably can get the person you're interested in to, uh, to kiss you uh, underneath the mistletoe. And this, again, you see, is associated with life, love, energy, fertility, and so forth, okay? Even in the dead of winter. So some of these things go back to very, very ancient rituals. And I mentioned this before when we were talking about the coming of Christianity to, to England, but also to the British Isles in general, because something similar, though not quite the same, happened with the coming of Christianity into places like uh, Wales and Ireland, certainly, which we know a lot about. And, and into Scotland, which we also know a good deal about. And uh, remember I mentioned that Pope Gregory the Great had written a letter to the Archbishop of Canterbury, a certain Melitus, who was the second guy after uh, the St. Augustine of Canterbury as Archbishop of Canterbury, and said the best way to uh, convert the peoples of the North is to try to accommodate Christian rituals and practices and beliefs as much as you can to the already existing practices, rituals, and beliefs of the people there. And I use the example of Halloween as one instance of this. But there are lots of others too. You know, obviously the Christian church 
appropriated things like the Christmas tree. I mean, nowadays you find, well, even going back very early, you find uh, Christmas trees inside the church, right? Not out there in some pagan shrine, but inside the Christian church, along with holly and so forth. So, okay. So the court, of course, is stunned by this, as one can well imagine people would be. Uh, talk about a marvel. This is a marvel indeed. So we have in line 232, the beginning of that stanza, there were stairs on all sides as the stranger spoke. For much did they marvel what it might mean that a horseman and a horse should have such a hue grow green as the grass, and greener it seemed, then green fused on gold, more glorious by far. All the onlookers eyed him an edge nearer and awaited in wonder what he would do. For many sights had they seen, but such a one never. So that phantom and fairy, the folk there deemed it. Phantom and fairy. Fairy as from the fairy world the world beyond our world, but which could penetrate into our world at certain times and under certain conditions. This is one of the reasons why Celtic scholars trace the story of the Green Knight back to early Irish narratives. Uh, there are some early Irish uh, uh, stories that have survived into modern times. Uh, you can go and read them in translation, by the way. There's a wonderful uh, paperback published by Penguin, uh, which is called Early Irish Myths and Sagas. Early Irish Myths and Sagas. And you can read a lot of that very, very early Irish material, uh, one of which is the story of a similar kind of beheading game that involves a giant and so on and so on. So it is likely then that this story, like many of the Arthurian stories, had some kind of very ancient Celtic connection. Therefore, cherry of answer was many a champion bold. I mean, these guys are sort of holding back. They don't know what's going on or what to do. And stunned at his strong words, stone still they sat in a swooning silence in the stately hall, and all were slipped into sleep, so slackened their speech apace. Not all, I think, for dread, but some of courteous grace, let him who was their head be spokesman in their place. So it is Arthur at the beginning of the next stanza who hails the Green Knight. Well, then the Green Knight proposes the beheading game. And he's, you know, he's, Arthur, of course, at first thinks, well, have you come to challenge, you know, one of the knights of the round table to fight in some kind of combat? Because that sort of thing often happens in the romances. And the uh, Green Knight replies in the stanza that begins in 279, Nay, to fight in good faith is far from my thought. There are about on these benches but beardless children. He's insulting the guys. Were I here in full arms on a haughty steed, for measured against mine, they might seem is puny, and so I call in this court for a Christmas game. A Christmas game, and this is going to be the beheading game. For it is Yule and New Year. Yule, Yule comes from the Old Norse word Yule, Yule. It's hard for an American to say that word, Yule. Uh, you kind of have to swallow the vowel to, to get it even close to right, um, which becomes our Yule. And Yuletide, right? 
you've heard the term Yule many, many times around Christmas time. Well, that also is a celebration among the very ancient pre-Christian North Germanic peoples, once again associated with evergreens. And many young bloods about and says, well, you know, is anybody here in Arthur's court this famed Camelot, these knights of the round table whom everybody talks about all over the world as the greatest warriors and bravest knights ever, anywhere? Will not any of these take up my challenge? And of course, nobody really does want to take up his challenge. And so Arthur finally picks up the axe in line 330. And the haft grips and sternly stirs it about. Well, you can't let the king go out and expose himself to this kind of danger, because after all, the king is the king. And the problem with a monarchical system, unlike a system such as our own political system, if, you know, if, the, if the president uh, dies or uh, is incapacitated, we have an orderly process for the government to continue, don't we? But in a monarchy, there is no similar orderly process. What if the king is killed here in this combat with the Green Knight? There's no heir apparent. What are they going to do? Fight to try to see who's going to become king? Well, that leads to chaos and civil war. So you don't let the king expose himself to danger. It's just like in battle. Sometimes you will have these descriptions of, you know, kings being out there, you know, wielding swords and all the rest of it. No self-respecting king would do that, and no self-respecting follower of a king would let the king do that if the king were so foolhardy as to want to do it. You just drag the king back, knock him over the head, tie him up to a tree if necessary, and say, stay put. You know, you can't allow the king to get killed. Uh, when it was when uh, in the Norman invasion, it was when King Harold of England was killed sometime around six o'clock in the evening, that that was the beginning of the end of the battle. Once the king was gone, the whole command structure of the Anglo-Saxon army appears to have fallen apart and people began to scatter in small groups. Some small groups you know, fought on, uh, generally speaking, to their death. But uh, that was really the beginning of the end. So one tries to protect one's king if one possibly can. So what does Gowan do? Gowan steps in in the next stanza, doesn't he? Um, well, at the end of the preceding stanza, this is uh, in 339, Gowan by Guinevere, toward the king doth now incline. I beseech before all here that this melee may be mine. Would you grant uh, me the grace, said Gowan to the king, to be gone from this bench and stand by you there, and so on and so on and so on. So Gowan is going to step forward as the champion for Arthur and the court. Well, then we find out in the stanza that begins in line 390 what Gowan must promise as part of the beheading game. Sir Gowan said the Green Knight, by God I rejoice that your fist shall fetch this favor I seek. Your fist shall fetch the favor I seek is to fetch the haft of the, uh, of the axe. And you have readily rehearsed and in right terms each cause of my covenant with the king, your lord, save that you shall assure me, sir, upon oath, that you shall seek me yourself 
wheresoever you deem my lodgings may lie, and look for my wages as you have offered me here before all this host. So Gowan is going to have to promise to come at the end of a year to the dwelling of the Green Knight and then bow before the Green Knight's axe, just as the Green Knight is going to bow before the axe swung by Gowan here, which happens in the next stanza. And notice, uh, oh, in about, you know, four twenty or so, we've got the nape, naked nape of his neck uh, is going to be uh, shown because, you know, he has to pull back. You have to pull back the uh, the long hair. Gowan grips to his axe and gathers it aloft. The left foot on the floor before him, he set, etc. And then, of course, he cuts through the neck of the Green Knight, so that the head was hewn off and fell to the floor. Many found it at their feet, as forth it rolled. The blood gushed from the body, bright on the green, yet fell not the fellow, nor faltered a whit. But stoutly he starts forth upon stiff shanks, and as all stood staring, he stretched forth his hand, laid hold of his head, and heaved it aloft, then goes to the green steed. See, he's beheaded now, but he's holding his, his head up by the hair. And he speaks to Gowan in the whole court and says in the next stanza that Gowan has to come at the end of the year to the Green Chapel, wherever the Green Chapel is, because he is, the Green Knight is, the Knight of the Green Chapel. And so part one of the romance ends at this startling point. But in the last stanza of part one, the feasting now begins. Remember that the feasting couldn't begin until a marvel took place. Well, to put it mildly, a marvel has very definitely taken place here with the Green Knight, is beheading is retrieving his own head, the head speaking to the court, and him riding out. And now they are left. <laughs>